from around the world. Um, if you're joining and you want French translation, uh, Wendy, tu veux dire quelque chose à propos la traduction française? Oui. Uh -huh. Voilà. There's a French translation available. Um, cliquez sur le bouton d'interprétation en bas de votre écran. Um, the rest of us will be managing in English. Um, really good to see you all. Um, we've only got an hour for this, um, so we're, we're going to jump straight in. I'm Jenny Hodgson. I'm Executive Director of the Global Fund for Community Foundations. Um, we've launched this report on giving circles recently, which we're really excited to share. We have it available in so far French, Portuguese and Spanish and are very happy to look at other translation into other languages too. If you're just joining us, welcome, welcome, welcome. welcome. Um, and we're going to crack on with it. So we're going to start um, with just a little test of where you all come to this giving circles thing. I think I should have launched a poll. Um, so the question is, how familiar are you with giving circles, just so we know who's on this call? So you have it's new to me, I know a little bit, or I'm very familiar and I, I already organize giving circles. So if you want to take a minute to answer that. Okay, so far we're looking like we know a little bit and we've got people who are completely new and some people who've done giving circles already and are quite expert in it. So that's, that's wonderful. Okie dokes. Um, I think we'll close the poll there. So to our speakers, um, we're first going to hear from Tarasai Jangara, who was the author of the report. Uh, and then we're going to hear from three colleagues who contributed to the report from uh, Russia, Palestine and South Africa. So Tarasai, can I hand over to you to start with to tell us wh why did you write this report? Thank you very much, Jenny. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. As the author of the paper, is that I'm really excited about today. And as I delve into the reasons why I worked on this paper, I will start with a short story about my mother. So growing up, I witnessed my mom being involved in different activities. At church, she belonged to the mother's union where she played a pivotal role in terms of the financial contributions that she made to support the church. Then in our neighborhood, she also belonged to a burial society where together with a group of friends, they made monetary contributions, which went into a funeral fund. And also at my school, she belonged to the Parents Teacher Association where she spearheaded fundraising activities to ensure that the school stayed afloat, and also just to ensure that educational development projects went ahead. In re retrospect, she was a donor, but she was never acknowledged as one. No one called her a donor, no one called her a philanthropist. There were no flashing cameras or even the media to document or even to capture the amazing work that she was doing in her community. So today I'm really excited about the launch of the paper, sister, brother, or someone who cares, because that, that's what, or that's who she was. She was just a sister. She was a mother who cared about her community and she made enormous contributions. So the excitement, the excitement that I have today is all around the celebration of everyday generosity that we see around the globe. So as I went into the research of this paper, I spoke to giving circle practitioners and organizers around the world, which included countries like Belgium, Brazil, Hungary, Palestine, Russia, Romania, South Africa, the United States, and Vietnam. And what really came out strongly is that despite the diversity of context, the purpose and the connections that come out through the giving cycles, they are all the same. And also 
my interest in this was because much of the information that has been documented, it strongly highlights on what happens in the United States, where we see that the giving circles, they have been used mostly in the African-American communities as an important tool with the purpose to reinstate a sense of the dignity and ownership among historically marginalized communities. They have also served as a way to build a pipeline for political leadership and engagement, validating the idea that meaningful engagement in communities can be nurtured through black giving. When it, when it comes to my own community, the African con continent, I rail from Zimbabwe. This has been a tradition that has been there, but probably it has been undermined. Not much is often mentioned about individual giving and everyday generosity. Yet it is a powerful tool that can aid community development. I will explain briefly and touch on the highlights, some of the things that really struck me as I carried the research of the paper and spoke to different individuals around the globe. Firstly, it was around the issue of redefining who is a donor. Because in the traditional age, we have always known that there are few individuals who are support, supposedly holders of philanthropic funds but this is a different case when it comes to the issue or even how giving circles look or are set up. Everyone is a donor and anyone can be a donor regardless of the amount that is put on the table. What is important is the coming together of different individuals to determine how they want to support their own communities without any prescription. And even in terms of how they measure impact, it's also the community that determines that. And giving circles have also been playing a pivotal role in terms of supporting underfunded causes. We see that in traditional aid, there are usually boxes where you already see that thematic areas are already prescribed. But the question is, are those thematic areas important to the communities. So we did giving circles during my research. I saw that it is the community themselves who determine and prescribe what they really want to focus on. And these are not your usual projects that you will see them funding, but these are projects that are really close to the community's heart. And also the issue of flattening power structures. It was really important for me and it really struck me that in terms of giving circles, a very powerful donor can be sitting right next to an ordinary giver. But in the end, the vote is the same. The decision is the same. So what I learned from this is that at times, it's a powerful conversation that is just needed between the have and the have nots for social change to happen. It's beyond money. It's beyond grants. But that discussion on the same table is what is really important. And it's something that we are really seeing all across the continent. And I'll even cite one of my favorite quotations from that research, where one speaker said, it is not always the grant that is needed, but a conversation with community leaders that brings about change. So in all this, what I have really learned is that giving circles, they are offering a powerful way of changing how we have to think as development actors about community engagement, which goes down to who is a donor, what communities are we looking at, and what are they bringing on the table? So the direct impact in our communities is really important, but it's the individuals on the ground who really have to respond to their own issues. And in this, even during the time of COVID, we saw that just giving circles, they responded to community realities without being overly 
hierarchical in terms of supporting local initiatives. And one speaker during, during my interviews said, giving circles are important because by the time we are waiting for external donors to come and solve a situation, it's either the situation would have disappeared or it has worsened. So as I conclude, I would just want to say, giving circles are really a powerful way of supporting and acknowledging the everyday generosity that happens in communities. That was really my biggest takeaway as the author of the paper. Thank you, Jenny, over to you. Wonderful, thanks, Teresai. Um, and I know from accompanying Teresai during this research as we reflected on the various conversations, it was a really kind of iterative process. Um, so uh, if you've just joined, welcome. If you've got questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat. We have um, simultaneous translation into French. Um, I think uh, in a minute, I'm gonna turn to you, um, Russia and to, to Palestine. So I just wanted to give you a minute's heads up. <laughs> um, but I think some of the points that Teresa I raised about you know, individual giving, people giving in communities, uh, has always existed. So giving circles are something that is both new and that we've had forever. And I think the articulation of it in um, African-American communities in the US as a real re expression and reclaiming and reorganizing of power is, is, is hugely relevant. But also this idea of how it's a way to shift ownership from a kind of, you know, in the private sector, you might call it shareholder, uh, stakeholder ownership to shareholder ownership. So shareholder ownership, to stakeholder ownership. So money, doesn't matter how much money you bring, you all have one, one vote. And that just being a really important mechanism for democratizing philanthropy and giving. And at the Global Fund, we are really interested, and I think I want to emphasize that the real interest in this report was on the why, for what, what's going on in terms of power and participation and, and trust building. So this conversation is going to very much be framed around that. The report itself gives you a quick kind of 101 of what a giving circle is and other resources to provide um, for, for you to, to, to look to. But, but Rasha, you're joining us from Palestine, from the Dahlia Association, which is a community foundation um, in Palestine, which has been around for what, 15, 16 years and community philanthropy has been a central tenet of your work, but also in the context of critiquing kind of top-down aid and donor development. Can you tell us a little bit about why Dahlia decided that a giving circle might be something that you could use in the context of your own purpose and your strategy? Thank you, everyone. And I will say bonjour to De La Palestine for those who are speaking uh, or just from French-speaking countries. So thank you, Jenny, your question is very relevant in this context of Palestine. As you, as you see, the, 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 during the 90s, we had an influx of uh, international aid that came after the, uh, the first intifada, uh, after the peace agreements. So uh, this aid always came with conditions and it always maintained this uh, status quo of the occupation. It hasn't really uh, changed this status quo, Palestinians are still uh, under uh, the occupation and they're lo losing land and all of that. So these aid packages haven't really changed the situation as they claim to have. So uh, bringing giving circles uh, as a tool and a method uh, really breaks these uh, this uh, conditions. So um, it, it brings back the sense sense of, of agency through the act of giving. So it's a way to defy the status quo. And uh, people come together uh, because they know that they choose these initiatives. They understand that they are not uh, set by big donors who have priorities. So it's like funding small initiatives that are not on the radar of these big donors. So this is very crucial in the context of Palestine and for the context of trying to gain back this sense of uh, autonomy and agency. Wonderful. And, and, and can you, uh, when you started organizing the Giving Circle, who, who needed to be in the room? How did you get them there? 
and, and what was the experience? How did you kind of combine the, the serious purpose you've got here with this actually being something that people came together and as, as Tarisai said, the relational piece of it, of people being in a room together. Can you just say a word about that? So um, the Giving Circle, this social change auction, this is what we branded it in Palestine. Uh, we made it open for everyone because we believe that everyone is a donor, as Teresai mentioned. So we made it open. And of course, to encourage people to give, we compared things that they usually pay for. And instead, uh, instead of the money for a cup of coffee, for example, they would go and pay that money for supporting community initiatives. So uh, showing this thing was really helpful to understand that they can give away this tiny amount of money, like $5. And, uh, and support local initiatives. So this uh, process is very inclusive. And by making it open, people understand that, okay, I can be a donor. I don't have to have a, 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 big, a huge amount of wealth to be able to support local communities. Thank you. I love that it's philanthropy as a cup of coffee. And I think that's very much in keeping with the sort of you know the, the emergence of movements like um giving tuesday and the funding networks which is supported with the kind of nuts and bolts of how to do giving circles but that idea that everyone can give and actually there's not just about mobilizing money but mobilizing mobilizing people i'm going to turn we're going to travel down the african continent to the tip to cape town to beulah fredericks who's with the community development foundation of western cape and um we i've mentioned you know the giving circles as a sort of alternative to the control of top-down donor aid. But Beulah said something incredibly moving in the report. Workership, Beulah's organization works mainly in the, um, in the communities townships of the Western Cape. And she said, um, we allow the groups to be flexible without putting any controls. If you look at township communities, there is control by gangs, control by drug lords, control by political parties. There are many controlling mechanisms sometimes, which sometimes take away power and dignity. And I think that that sort of just as another way of seeing how one can create a space which is different where people feel free. So Beulah, would you tell us a little bit about, again, why CDF came to looking at giving circles, how you went about it, you know, what, what did you do? Um, thank you, Jenny. Um, let us start first to say um, to congratulate you and the team for, for this um, document and the launch of this document. I, I, I also see it as a celebration and you've just quoted that powerful quote right now and it talks to me through that. So yeah, um, why did we start it? You know, the community development team is a very small one and we must double up and we must triple up um, just to get through our commitments. Um, so to stay relevant, we needed um, to innovate and we had to focus on what we, that I look at the big R's. We need to reimagine, we need to reflect and we must refocus. So that was a focus for us. So in, in um, 2018, when the opportunity came to, to make seed grants to communities, um, more to establish community funds because we wanted to give power to community to take control of what they have. Um, that really helped us um, to look at how we could look at ownership deeper and community buy-in. So we look at community assets were in abundance, I must say, but not in terms of money. What came in for us very clearly was there was the intangibles in our communities. It's not all um, doom and gloom. It was about hope, it was about aspirations, and it was about trust and relationships. So that is what we saw in it. So the community funds in 2018 became the pathway through which we thought we could test the potential and the promise of localized giving, of community giving, you know? Um, and that is really how we started back. And what we learned, I look at the community, um, the giving circles as a powerful platform or tool that could ad that enhances um, giving. And I look at what was the potentialities that this giving circle brought. 
Number one, it brought ordinary people into the circle and they, they and their involvement felt they felt they were noticed and counted. Um, it brought the the whole dimension of power, how uh, power plays out at, in play, and people could look at it and they could say, you know, I bring what I have. And I think it demystified philanthropy. And we heard that when Terrence I said, what is philanthropy? It demystified it. It also brought us everybody in that circle to an e on an even hill. Um, it serves as a mapping strategy because it's not money that came into our circles first. People in that circle realized what I have counted time counted, um, the potential that they have in terms of how they help each other, the peer support that they have, solidarity counted. And I think that is so important for us that money will follow. And I think to map also donations in kind that came and add a value to it counted. And, at, you know, they, uh, there was a sense that people felt the giving circle is about money and that we must come in and bring money. But it was not about that. It was about, and, and people were very apologetic about it, that what I have is so small. And not realizing that whatever you give is it counted and it can bring meaningful change. So I think that was it. And more importantly, and I think Teresa also mentioned that it was the space for conversation. And that is, that is, and also to discuss what I talk, the, the, the burning issues in that particular community. Um, so that is for us a big reason why we started the community um, giving circles um, um, in, in our communities, not only to plow back, but also to, to help in-country diaspora to come in. Many people, young people especially, moved out of townships into more affluent communities, but they didn't know how to come back and how and what they can do. So I think that that currency was also a very important one for us. So in, in, that, in that space, I think um, that was the very much the reason why we re look at it. Very difficult, different to the document here and very diverse in what I, what I read. And, but I feel very excited that there are possibilities um, for giving circles to grow in township communities, in informal settlements, but ordinary people that, that feel what, I, what they have to offer counts and it can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beulah. Um, I mean, that, that idea that people are apologetic for what they give, and yet, you know, a lot of data shows that actually it's, it's always those with least who give proportionally most of what they of their income compared you know that billionaires can give millions but it's still just a tiny proportion and i think that that that's a really important for us to remember the giving is happening it's just not being acknowledged in the same way but also this idea of the process of kind of social economic development being about you know about networks about relationships about tilling the soil creating the soil on which you know, the rain or money <laughs> can, can land, um, you know, the costs of doing work where there is no trust in the community and how this is so important for building that relational capital. Before I turn to Tatiana, Bula, could you just tell us a little bit about where did people meet? I mean, spaces matter, who comes, who feels comfortable, what time of day, who came, did you offer tea? Can you just talk about that side of things? You know, it's very interesting in one community we we met in in a backyard and um, and it was in the height of um, the drought or with we had no water um, in our communities so we brought um, tea to you know took our own to to that meeting for me in that giving circle it was so important that we could offer something at that day because for many there was no water to make a cup of tea 
So I think it is so important. We talk about the fun part of, of giving circles um, the, and the flexibility they are, that, that, that we keep that because, you know, in our communities, I mean, the first thing they will ask you to would you like some tea. Um, so yes, we will do that. So we will meet wherever communities were available, um, in the, if they could find a hall in, in the front rooms, um, in the yard. Um, I know in the Nova Park, we had to move, the circle was a bit, bit bigger. We went across the road um, and to that um, uh, community hall. And I must say that on that day, the security came in and told us, please, you can't come out. There was a shooting um, just outside. But within that circle, there was no panic. And in that circle, there was that solidarity and that we know that we should understand what is happening in our community, that this circle can make a difference in whichever way they can play. So very volatile at times um, because we work in contested communities. So um, what, whatever we plan can be so different on the day. Um, but it's important, what, it was always important for, for us and for me to meet people wherever they are and whatever they offer. But as a foundation, we will make, you know, make it very special um, and, um, and, and allow communities to just feel comfortable in a safe space. I think um, giving circles can be that safe space um, for us at times. Um, and it also that build the connect connectivity that wherever you come from, because they come from around other communities or further down the street, that within here we equals, we all are, you know, um, I think the one, one big lesson was that in this circle, whatever we give, it's the art of giving and we experience that, that came through. So yeah, wherever, wherever communities um, could meet and whatever is available, um, you know, Location matters, yeah, and we could be better, but I think it's important to meet within that community and experience what is around it. Right, thank you. Yeah, there were spaces where people feel comfortable, where they can feel they can engage themselves. Thank you, Beulah. Okay, so hang on, hold on. We're going to travel from the bottom of the <laughs> African continent right up to the top of the world, just to the edge of the Arctic, to Arkhangelsk. Um, where we are delighted that Tatiana can join us from um, Garant, uh, which is a resource center and community foundation, um, a long-term partner of, of ours. And Tatiana, um, I think there are others on this call for whom, um, there are some on the call for whom the issue of international donors and international development and international NGOs is a big part of their ecosystem. In Russia, it's a bit different, isn't it? And yet um, Giving Circles, the work you've done there has been a really strategic um, direction that you have pursued um, to, to, to embed your work in, in, the, in the communities and region you work in. So can you tell us about, you know, what was the logic that led you to be attracted to the idea of giving circles and what were you trying to do um, by organizing them? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, yes, that's true. We work in the quite severe weather conditions and uh, in uh, the region, which is uh, over 600,000 square kilometers, it's modern France, and with lots of remote communities, with lots of uh, remote towns and villages. And uh, since uh, for over 20 years, we've been working with development of culture of giving and philanthropy. We've been always looking for new ways to develop it, both individual and cooperative uh, uh, giving. And uh, uh, in 2018, we started with Giving Circles, and for us, it's more than just uh, a fundraising event. It's uh, building up community uh, program or campaign. Uh, so, uh, uh, as uh, Jenny mentioned, we are a resource center for NGOs, and uh, we've been supporting NGOs and training them. And uh, we give NGOs a chance to present their work. Uh, by this, we build trust between citizens who come to our events, and normally it's more than 100 people per event, and NGOs who can speak up about their work, what they do, uh, can ask, answer questions of people. And uh, thus we 
engage citizens uh, into long-term individual giving. They start to trust NGOs, they start to support NGOs, and as Russia correctly mentioned, they start to believe that by very small sums, but all together, they can uh, support very good projects and uh, le which lead to social change. Um, what is also important for us that um, uh, among our uh, participants or attendants of our, uh, uh, of our giving circles, they are representatives of large companies, because we invite friends, friends of friends, neighbors, friends of neighbors, we started like this at the very beginning, and uh, we also get very good cooperative donors uh, for, for us and uh, for other NGOs. Um, Another thing what uh, we, uh, it's necessary to mention that for us, preparation for the giving circle is a sort of a training program for NGOs because we choose NGOs, but not the projects. And then during two months, we spend a lot of time with these NGOs, training them. Uh, they develop competencies of uh, presentation, of uh, speaking to uh, authorities, speaking to businesses and uh, they feel much more confident to uh, speak about themselves and also to raise funds for their work. So probably I mentioned main things why we started and why we would like to go on with uh, organizing given circles. Thanks, Tatiana. Of course, the other interesting factoid about our hangles is um, it's, a, it's a city which has a, like in winter, you have how many hours of daylight? Two, uh, sometimes four, 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 two, two, four. three, four, and yes. In summer, it never gets dark. So you imagine, have to imagine doing all this work in that context too. But Tatiana, can you just say a bit more, um, you, you know, there's a lot of conversation these days about the shrinking space, the importance of mobilizing local resources, and there's a, a funding imperative here. But in many parts of the world, there is also a kind of public distrust of NGOs. Um, you know, for whatever reason, a sort of historically or re more recently kind of encouraged by government saying that NGOs are troublemakers or foreign agents, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I, I, I think it's really interesting that you're deliberately looking at community as it's made up of lots of people who do lots of different things, including working in the corporate sector or in government, like we are many things. But can you talk about that particular dimension of, of how you use the giving circle really to kind of you know, raise the visibility and of, of, of NGOs and the work that they're doing. Um, yeah, would you mind saying something about that? <laughs> yes, yes, true. Uh, first of all, we try to find organizations which are not visible. They work in small communities and, and in the city of Okangos, in the center of our region, nobody knows about them. Uh, second, uh, before the given circle, we organized a big information campaign, uh, inviting uh, television and other medias to speak about these non-governmental organizations who are going to present their projects. And uh, uh, besides, we managed to uh, invite people who have never donated and uh, who never heard about NGOs. Because when, despite we've been working for many years, for over 20 years in the Congress region, when we organize surveys, we see that over maybe 10% of population really know about uh, NGOs and uh, trust them. So for us, it's also like two months campaign for uh, uh, presenting NGOs work in our community. Oh, I, I wondered if you'd frozen off, it was me. It was just, okay. you were very still. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that's that's wonderful. Th thank you, Tatiana. Um, I, I wondered, um, Loanne, I, I know you're joining us from the Lynn Centre, and I was just about to write you a message to say, could um, uh, I come to you? But I, I wondered, um, I, I'd really like to open this conversation up now because, you know, we've got uh, the experiences of the three organisations here. It, it are documented in the report. Um, I'd love to get a sense of who else is engaged in giving circles or questions you might have. Um, I mean, it does raise questions about is this, you know, how much does it cost to do this? Is it really worthwhile, you know, the amount of work and the amount of money raised, those kinds of things. So I think just really to sort of air some of the 
the issues that are in the backs of your minds. But in the meantime, I wondered if I could travel now to Ho Chi Minh City to Luan, who is joining us from the, the Lin Center. I, I know you've done a lot of work. I, again, Vietnam is a country where there's less international aid, quite a constrained environment, mixed feelings about civil society. I think the, the idea of um, NGOs not being very good at telling their story probably also resonates quite well with you. Could you just share some reflections on how this sort of resonates for your work in Vietnam and how it fits or what you're hearing? Sorry to hijack you, it's just your camera is on and you're right in front of me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, when I listened to Tatiana's story about uh, uh, the people uh, in the community, they are uh, not very well aware of the work even though the NGOs have been there for a very long time, they, they're doing, they've been doing the work for, for years, but then the awareness of the people in, in the community, not, not very high. So I, I feel related to that story uh, because um, in Vietnam we have, I, I just checked on, on um, the Ministry of Science and uh, Technology, which is the main um, government agency that manage all the NGO, the uh, NPOs, a uh, nonprofit organization and uh, CBOs, all that in Vietnam. And I see that they, they uh, reported a number of 7,000 uh, 7, registered NPOs in, in Vietnam. Uh, but I know that there are a lot more, the number is much more higher than that because they are unregistered uh, organization in, in, in the country. Uh, but unfortunately, I also came across a, um, uh, a report. Uh, this report has been done for a couple of years back, and it's really sad that the people in the community they 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 really have um, not much knowledge about uh, NGOs in in their communities, their presence in the community. I, I'm I'm not um, I'm not really understand why. I don't really understand why. I think because of the people. Um, they kind of relate to all the charity, all the support programs kind of done by the state rather than uh, some uh, other organizations, private organizations or, or something like that. Um, yeah, so, so I feel quite relate to, to Tatiana's story about that. And I think the environment in Vietnam is uh, also similar to, to the environment in Russia where um, the, it's kind of, politically sensitive when you mention the CSOs, uh, all these terms. So even now we, um, yeah, so, so that's the environment is, is not as welcoming of CSOs in Vietnam, yeah. Thanks, thanks very much. And again, sorry for jumping on you to, <laughs> to speak. Um, but, but I think, yeah, that the framing of stakeholders, corporate, government, CSO, almost reinforces some of that sense of both stereotyping and, and hostility, um, rather than, you know, I think some of the work that we're doing at the moment is trying to sort of reframe conversations around what a good society might look like, where everyone can be, you know, have dignity, equity, um, you know, be, be treated with respect, have the resources they need, because sometimes that framing is, is, is one that doesn't really, it, it creates blockages rather than opening them. Um, Louise, you posted something intriguing uh, in the chat. Do you want to say a word about that? Jenny, give me one second. I have to go plug in my laptop um, and move inside. So <laughs> okay. can you come to me in a minute? <laughs> I can do. Okay. Um, yeah, the, as I said in the chat, the floor is open. Any any questions or, or comments um, while you're, just use the hand function or write in the chat. Um, but uh, Tatiana, let me come back to you because I think it's an important question in a Russian context. So what time does these things work? And I know that you mentioned in the report that a, a little drink of something helps kind of warm up the room. How, how, what's the sort of technology that you use, the sort of psychological, the warm side of mm -hmm. the, the giving mm -hmm. circle that, that you've found to be particularly effective? Mm -hmm. Uh, for us, it's a party. And for people who we invite, we invite people for a sort of a party because we give them 30 minutes, not more than 30 minutes, to drink some champagne, to talk with each other. And it's especially important for uh, VIP people 
who like to meet each other at such events and people who want to meet VIP people at such events. So 30 minutes for uh, live music, for champagne and for talking to each other. And then uh, we inspire and prepare angels to uh, present themselves in a very entertaining way that people can get some fun, can get some entertainment and uh, be motivated by emotional performances of angels to give more. So this we use and uh, we organize it in the evening. So it's about 7.30 normally on Friday. And uh, we often organize given circles in December before New Year and Christmas because people are more motivated to donate some money or some good initiatives before they go in for long-term holidays. Thank you. Yes, a little glass of champagne is going to oil the... <laughs> yes, champagne or wine, yes. We all, wine. We, yes. So we have sponsors who help us with this champagne and wine. We give also some food because uh, it's in the evening and sometimes people come after their offices. So we also provide some uh, starters and uh, even sometimes some uh, hot dishes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, oh, I'm trying to read and talk at the same time, which is a mistake. Um, I wonder if I could just pop to you quickly, Irina. You're in, in Moscow and you're with Charities Aid Foundation. And I know we're engaged in other conversations around the, the challenges, like the emergence of these sort of grassroots organizing, particularly around giving and philanthropy, and this is around trust building, but how hard it is to, to, to measure or see this or to translate it into something that's greater than the sum of its parts. I'm, I wonder if you could just tell us about what you're seeing in terms of the number of giving circles there are in Russia and why you think it's taking off and what else you're seeing from that kind of higher, you know, bird's eye view that you have. Thank you, Jenny. Um... Yes, it's surprisingly, despite of COVID and all, all the restrictions, we still have in our community foundations and uh, arranging events uh, and they are real time. You know that uh, maybe you know that uh, there is uh, like tendency that um, more and more events are switched uh, online, but as well, actually in Russia, I think it won't work. Maybe I think uh, Tatiana will agree with me. Yes, so we're still, uh, of course, uh, uh, you lose those um, feeling of community when you are online, especially if it's a first event. How well, it's really, I mean, problematic to, to, to launch the, the first event online. So we're still uh, do it. Uh, in person, and last year uh, we had 20 uh, given second uh, events in Russia in different cities, small and big, and even uh, villages. Uh, here with us also, we have our colleague and friend Vera, they're from a very small community uh, in Karelia, uh, and they're arranging events in uh, small uh, villages, like maybe 100. Oh, only citizens yeah there so um and i actually i wanted to ask a question uh, two questions to colleagues uh, i wonder uh, what's your based on your experience yeah how often should you hold these events because i see the risk that people feel like boring or not again given a circle and well how often should you hold it to keep people motivated. And um, another question is, how do you uh, choose the projects? Because what I see when, well, of course, uh, when the first event was successful, for example, there were three projects presenting uh, their, um, yeah, what they want to do and there was, uh, they got support they needed and even more money. Also many other projects want to join next time. And of course, there is some, how to avoid those uh, people not to be offended, like, why do you choose this project? So that, or why didn't you choose mine? So how do you decide? So everyone is happy and and you still that uh, transparency yeah, and people still trust you as organizers of given circles. So I think this is a two point, mm. important points for, for me, yeah. Great question. Um, does somebody want to respond to that? I mean, the, the question about how do you keep this interesting and keep the momentum going? Because like going once might be great. Second time, cool. Third time, yeah, I've done that. You know, humans are very fickle creatures. But that also that issue of fairness. Um, 
And I guess also, how do you put more difficult issues on the table? I mean, is there a tendency to go for softer issues? But anyone want to comment on that? And then I, as what happens, we've got a few people I want to come to. So um, yeah, Rasha, do you want to say a word on that? Yeah, so uh, we've done the social change auction for three times and during COVID we stopped. But um, the first time we got people excited and they were very happy about it. The second time they started believing it and it's like a shift so people come back so they believe and they see the impact it's always about communicating the impact uh, about those initiatives that they supported in the event uh, it's always very important to keep that uh, another question um, uh, the third event which happened we had to do it closed um, in a closed circle because of covid we had to do invitation only uh, people came back because they really wanted uh, to, to support again. So it, it's like you're building a reputation for such an event. So you always have to build up. Uh, regarding your question about how do we select initiatives, at, at Dali Association, it's a community foundation. So we always seek, uh, we use the participatory approach when we uh, select the initiatives. So we have a committee and this committee looks at the applications. We do them as videos and uh, uh, they have to follow a criteria that Dahlia puts, which includes focusing on uh, the social, environmental and cultural dimensions. These are the only dimensions yeah. that we focus on, that it supports these, these yeah. four dimensions. And then uh, the committee chooses based on these four dimensions. And it's a very transparent and uh, uh, open process that answers your question. Wonderful. Thank you. OK, this is the point where you've got 12 minutes left and suddenly the chat is all okay, taking off. So people on, want to people. respond. David, oh, he's on me. Um, if people want to respond to some of the questions in the chat, I see the example from Can Canavese. Um, that in Italy, this has been a, a great idea. Ritu Pond is talking from India about, you know, the shrinking space, making this kind of technology really important. Louise, I'm going to come back to you, but first I want to come to Wamuyu Martha, mm -hmm. <laughs> who's uh, on my screen there, who's joining us from uh, uh, Kilimani Project Foundation in Nairobi. Martha, do you want to respond to what you're hearing? You, you work at, at a, in a neighborhood level, very engaged, lots of engagement with the community. Um, and I want to hear from you. And, and Philip, I have noted your skepticism in the chat. So um, I don't know if anyone else wants to address this, but I think there is a conversation to be had about, you know, yes, there are deep barriers towards how CSOs think they're going to get their money, but what are the opportunities to push back against that and, and, and build alternatives? So Martha, do you want to say a word about how this sounds to you yes. from where you sit. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And thank you, Jenny, for, for this opportunity. Uh, it's really great hearing all the stories and um, how people are using different ways, you know, to bring together uh, the communities around them to, um, you know, to mobilize local giving at um, local levels. So I represent Kilimani Project Foundation, um, which is a neighborhood association in the middle class um, here in Nairobi. And I think in our context, how we've been able to, our context of giving circles is um, a case scenario I would like to give that happened recently is uh, we, we face various issues that come up uh, around urban planning and um, our organization is membership based. So members come together and to talk about issues that are of importance to them. And um, for instance, recently we've uh, experienced issues around noise pollution where, you know, this conflict between businesses and residents, um, seeing that Kilimani is um, sort of a mixed use um, area. And uh, what was interesting is uh, when the residents who are affected come together in form of a committee. Um, so for instance, in this case, they agreed to fundraise to get someone to track and report on issues um, around noise pollution and also to communicate to various stakeholders in the government um, and, and, and give reports back to the community. And this has happened in so many um, instances. Um, most of our initiatives are community led uh, by the residents uh, on a voluntary basis. 
So how we mobilize is we look for a time that works for each and every uh, person and we bring them together for a meeting which is facilitated by the foundation. But the decisions are primarily made by, um, by, by the members, you know, themselves. So they tell us this is what we want uh, the foundation through its um, networks and um, whatever it's able to mobilize is. Um, so we give them that platform as, as a community foundation. So this, you know, giving circles, um, it resonates uh, with what we, you know, with what we do. We might not call it giving circles, but it's, it is happening um, at, you know, um, at Kilimani Project Foundation. Yeah, and I think that's that's really it's great because I think it's important to see all these things in the context of each other. These are all about getting people into spaces to work out what they want to do. Um, Louise, I haven't forgotten about you, but just want to kind of build off this. I want to ask Philip to say something and tell us where you're joining us from. You've voiced some deep skepticism, and I'm sure there are people on this call who want to convince you otherwise, uh, either on this call or, or off it. But tell us, tell us about where where, where you are and. Um, where you are geographically in Uganda and where you are in terms of this conversation. You'll have to unmute. Okay, thank you so much. I'm called Philip Wandawa from Uganda. And what happens, what you're talking about is almost a new story for us. For us here, the belief is that uh, a donor has to come from the US or if not from Europe, Europe. And those we think as who would be as donors have interest, interest terms to whatever they are giving. An example, uh, there are questions on what is that that is given? There's another question, where is it given? When is it given and why is it given? So you, 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 really, you really come to, to query what I would regard as, as donation, because I would think uh, donation is, is, is meant for goodwill or is meant for changing status for maybe a given community. Here, the story is different. As, as what I want to, uh, to, 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 to maybe as a recommendation is that maybe there will be such engagement that at the end, we we'll copy a leaf from the other side that can be brought here. Otherwise, here the situation is different. Now, when it comes to government, when it comes to the matters of you people collecting money, as if it raises it raises antennas of government with the belief that maybe they're organizing money to host the government. So there's a lot of there's a mix of, of issues here, and the, yeah. what what we are getting the other side is really giving us giving me a very good impression that if we had such exchanges, we would find a way how we get trainings, which trainings would maybe be be adopted in policy to help us move forward. That is what is there, and that's what I can tell you. Also. Thank you. Thank you. And um, yes, I think maybe you can contact us after this call as well, because I think there is some interesting stuff going on in Uganda, but it's sort of at the edges. And I think this is the opportunity is hearing other countries who've traveled the same, you're, you're traveling in the same footsteps of them and to learn from peers and allies, because that importance of changing the narrative, I think is so important, changing that mindset, those mental models about who has money and who has power. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to come now to Louise, um, take a couple of minutes and then come back to our speakers just to say, if they want to, any closing remarks. And, and Bueller, I know you wanted to respond to Philip there, so if you, if you don't mind doing it then. So Louise, tell us about what you shared um, in the chat. Thank you. And first, I just want to say when I moved inside, I'm, I'm sort of house sitting a farm. I The book that I put uh, my laptop on is Audre Lorde's The Master's Tools Will not, Never Dismantle the Master's House, which I've not, never read. In it was meant must. to be. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. So um, I just want to share this, um, and it'll be about two minutes. Is that okay? Yes. I mean, or if you can tell us about it, or yeah, I mean, we've got four minutes, so just bear that in mind. And we can share okay, it afterwards so with the group. I'll start, and then you just stop me, or I might stop. So okay. something is shifting the economic fabric of the city. So this is a story I wrote. Um, globally, things are becoming less stable, yet more people have meaningful, liberating, and fulfilling work. 
Communities describe themselves as resilient and self-sustaining. People young and old have centered, uh, created and joined social hubs or amadombile um, to take the power of their communities into their own hands. They are not taking back their power from anyone. They are making their own. Um, these hubs exist in thousands of communities across South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, um, with more being incubated every day. There are community centers that have become the center of the community, the lifeblood of the community. In them, people eat, learn, imagine, and create to make almost everything they need. There are workshops, cinemas, meeting spaces, schools, universities, play spaces, gardens, creches, libraries, community kitchens. In some cases, there are even hospitals. And the story goes on, it's really about cities. So obviously yeah. this is happening in African uh, communities all around um, Africa. And this is about how these principles might look in a city where we gather everything that we, um, we need and repurpose waste in order to actually create what we need to survive in cities and grow food in amongst every little part. So I can share it here if anyone's interested. Yes, that would be great. And we can also send it out to this group who registered here. Um, and and we're, we're using something similar. I've just posted around the framing of a, of a good society. I think there's a lot of interesting thinking about, you know, giving circles in the context of all these other ways of rethinking, reimagining, regenerative economies, um, I think is really powerful if we can see these things alongside each other. Okay, my friends, we have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to start, ask Beulah, what is it you wanted to say to Philip? Then I'm going to come to you, Rasha, you, Tatiana, and then Tarasai. So you've all got about 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. I, I, I just was very moved when um, Philip said the, and I want to say, it's very different in Uganda, and I get it. And then he said, it's nothing of that kind. And the word nothing was like, I felt uncomfortable with that. And then he talked about, it's all about interest. And I thought, if there's interest in what interest of a community or people has an interest. And then I thought about our situation. Year, where I think the mistake that, that I made with the giving circle is to call it a giving circle because immediately there was this notion it's about money. Um, so that that was for me, if you look at it's um the flip side of giving circles that what we what we call it make, def, uh, makes a, a big difference. And then I want to talk about interest because can, there's always interest in something. And then I wrote there that the giving circle is a space for aspirations to become connected to one another. And through these circles of inner connectivity and intense listening, Community members in that circle have the ability and the intent to move to a point where challenges and concerns from the individual to the collective can be converted. And I and I and I want just want to encourage him to say, I hear what he's saying that there's always that possibility on and that there's not nothing. And I think we should have the conversation. Um, you know, I would love to talk to Philip um, yeah. around that. So I think that it was a word that he used that moved me to say, just take a uh, reframe and, 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 and look at uh, what's around you. So thank you, Philip, yes. for, for that. <laughs> for opening that door. Now you have to step in, Philip. Okay, um, Rasha, any final thoughts? You don't have to, you can just say, no, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to also to comment on Philip and uh, say the rem uh, this reminder that it's, um, it's a political act when you decide to choose uh, creating these events. It's like a statement that goes beyond saying that uh, you're defying this, that these donors should be European slash Americans. So when you decide to do a, a giving circle, it really gives back power to you as an organization. So I really recommend adopting this as a tool. <laughs> there you go. You get all this advice for free, Philip. Tatiana, any final thoughts from you? I can only say that uh, we, we will be very happy to share our experience because we prepared a book in Russian for uh, Russian community foundations with all our experience and practical recommendations how to organize this, uh, the given circle, even with all the checklists, with all the forms necessary for organization. We were very thorough in this. So 
Philip or others who want to start with giving circles, we will be happy to speak and to uh, share our experience in detail. Wonderful, thank you. This was a very generous movement. Tarasai, <laughs> do you want to close us out? <laughs> thank you so much, Jenny. Just to emphasize that uh, by emphasizing the importance of giving circles in this paper, and in this discussion, it doesn't mean that we are doing away with institutional donors. Instead, they do have a role to play in terms of providing capacity development support and also even matching grants that can ensure that um, giving circles do flourish. But in doing that, as one speaker or contributor to the paper said, some humility is needed all around, particularly with institutional donors recognizing the depth and knowledge that exists within giving cycles. So I'll end by saying, let us, let us all appreciate everyday generosity and everyday givers. But we are here as the Global Fund for Community Foundations to support for those who really want to explore the idea, adapting it to their own context in their own communities. Thank you so much for the support and for reading the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Sorry. So, I mean, I think the, the yes, the point about it's political and there is a role of funders and it's part of a larger conversation with international funders to fund architecture, infrastructure, mechanisms that can facilitate communities, not NGOs that can just deliver projects. And I think it's all part of that reimagining. And there is a role for international NGOs and a role for international donors and domestic donors. So it's, it's really like seeing that in the context of those bigger conversations. Sorry for going three minutes over time. Really appreciate your participation and your engagement. Enjoy the rest of your day.